Welcome to another of our Wednesday Yachting Luncheons. The view couldn't be better out these windows. Holy moly. Tonight we get to go racing in that beautiful bay. And we're going to hear lots about the bay today. A little bit about future speakers. It turns out that uh, the berth for the Finn class will be heavily contested from America this year with Luke Muller and Caleb Payne going uh, you know, hammer and tong at each other to earn that berth on June the 12th. You'll get to listen to what they have to say on this subject. On May 26th, your watch captain will change roles and be the speaker here. And the talk I'm going to give is called, They Came for the Gold, They Stayed for the Yachting, The Birth of Racing on San Francisco Bay. Starting in 1855, we talk about the beginnings of racing sailboats in San Francisco Bay. Um, on uh, May 31st, next week, Terry Hutchinson will be here to talk about the what I would call them uh, one of the leading, if not the leading, America's Cup challenge. Uh, American Magic has got um, you know a foiling prototype. It's up on a foil that's very much like that, which will be used in New Zealand. Uh, they've got a big program, more north of 100 million dollars in their program, and they'll be uh, racing their hearts out down there, uh, prototyping and then racing in New Zealand. So we're going to hear all about uh, Terry's program the 29th next week here. Um, a little bit about our speaker today. So how many people here have been on the bay? Hands up. Okay. How many people um, recognize that the water coming through the bay comes from the mountains in eastern part of California? Sierra Nevada, and it flushes out the bay every day. More water goes out the bay than comes in the bay. It floods in, and then it washes out, ebbs out. So the ebb is greater than the flood. San Francisco Bay is cleaner than a normal estuary because of this fresh water that flows outside of our bay all the time. So we're going to hear today about um, efforts to decrease the faucet up uh, above the delta and decrease the amount of water that comes through the delta and automatically, by definition, therefore, decrease the amount of water that cleanses our bay twice every day. To speak about that, we'll have a speaker who started in uh, Chicago. And um, we, our yacht club, does well all around the world in, in lots of races, um, in challenges around the world, because we have an incredible program of challenge cups and a very active uh, flags and here to welcome you all is our Commodore Paul Heineken. Paul. Thanks, Ron. I wasn't sure I'd get a turn here because we were doing all of the uh, introductions. We've got great programs ahead of us. I'm just here to say from the board, the flags, all the members, welcome uh, online, our online community. And uh, for those who aren't in California, try listening closely because we have a very unique water system and water challenges in our future. And I was reminded at, uh, a few minutes ago that I gave a, after a CDC conference on uh, climate change and public health, I moved it over to the Yacht Club uh, about five years ago. And things have changed dramatically since then in terms of people's understanding of climate change and the fact that the entire Midwest is flooded right now. So water and climate change, uh, you know, go together. They have health implications and they have health impl implications for our Delta. So there, I just extended Ron's interview because it's something I'm interested in. But, uh, and, the, and the yachting news is that our chairman of the board just got back from the Star European Championships where he finished third out of 92 boats on his 60th birthday. Awesome Paul Kayard. Okay. Yonya Paulo. Yonya Paulo. So um, our speaker started, her first boating experience was on Lake Michigan. She spent some time fishing with her family, and then she spent some time sailing in a catamaran as a young three-year-old. She spent lots of time on Lake Michigan uh, and got used to this incredible experience that we have of recreation on the water, moved out here to California. And as opposed to many people, when she saw what was happening 
um, in the Delta and saw the need for incredible vigilant action. In 2006, she founded Restore the Delta. So it's a wonderful thing that we're going to get to have here from the founder of Restore the Delta, Barbara Berrigan Perella. Barbara, come on up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ron, and uh, thank you to everyone in the club. Do I have this adjusted right, and can you hear me all right? And I guess uh, I'm just looking, no clicker. I can just go ahead and move the screen. Perfect. Uh, thank you. It's an interesting time to be here. So much is changing right now in processes as they relate to the uh, San Francisco Bay Delta Estuary, that we are in the process of retooling all our communications and retooling um, what we're talking about and what's happening. We've had a major victory. We probably had the second most important victory uh, last month after the defeat of the Peripheral Canal, and that is that the Twin Tunnels project is over. Yay. <laughs> and uh, it took us 12 years, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, and what's happening with processes. But before we engaged really in the tunnel fight, when we were founded in 2006, and it wasn't just me, it was a wonderful group of people who helped put us together. It included people from the business community, our local chambers of commerce, people from environmental organizations like the Planning and Conservation League, Earth Justice, uh, NRDC, California uh, Sport Fishing Protection Alliance. Those are some of the people who were there with us at the beginning. Uh, Delta Farmers, uh, people from the business development community, and we have grown from our initial meeting with about 12 founding members, a community meeting of 60 people, um, to over 60,000 supporters throughout California over the last 12 years. Yeah. So. <laughs> and it's, it's an interesting coalition to hold together. It's very diverse. Uh, we work with the business development community and the environmental justice community. We work with recreational boaters and sailors. We work with farmers, and yet everybody has a common goal, and that is an absolute love for the San Francisco Bay Delta Estuary. Uh, it's one of the most unique places uh, in the entire world. It's one of two inverted estuaries. So here where we are today, of course, at the end of the bay, you're at a saltwater bay. Where I live up uh, in North Stockton, between uh, Stockton and Lodi, um, it's freshwater. And it's freshwater along the Sacramento River. And that tidal flow uh, that Ron was just discussing actually impacts river flows all the way up past the I Street Bridge in Sacramento every day. So it, it's an amazing system. Our fisheries have evolved over tens of thousands of years to migrate and move from freshwater to saltwater and, and back and forth. So it, it, it's unique, it's lovely, um, and it's definitely a place we believe that is worth fighting for. When we were founded back then, the Tunnels Project was just being discussed. We were really founded initially to work on water quality and quantity issues and to work on reductions in overpumping the delta from the current pumping system. And that battle is very back much alive right now. So a little bit, if you take a look up at our logo, um, it's the original logo. It is the fishable, swimmable, drinkable, farmable logo for Restore the Delta. And in many ways, it's, more, it's become even more important right now than a save the tunnel or stop the, uh, save the delta, stop the tunnel sort of um, argument. Today, um, we're going to talk about why the San Francisco Bay Delta matters, what are the process that are in, processes that are happening right now, what's happening legislatively to have impacts on the Delta. We're going to talk a bit about how we believe we can best solve the conveyance challenge. And then we're going to talk about state water management and regional outcomes. And this is a quick primer uh, to remind people exactly about how water does work in California. This is a wonderful map that shows our rivers, our streams, uh, how the water system is fed throughout California. And it's no surprise to people here. If you take a look at it, most of the water's up north. Most of the people are down south. 
And so that's what we have to solve. How do you protect those areas up in the north? How do you protect the Delta and the Bay, uh, but get basic water to people who need water that live in the other part of the state? Uh, about 45, 50% of the state's water drains through the estuary and into the San Francisco Bay. One of the things I always like to talk about at this point is that when you've heard of the myth that it's fish versus farmer. That was a campaign that was created, funded by Westlands Water District 10 years ago. Um, and it was created by the Burson Marsteller advertising firm, the same people who ran the pro tobacco campaign. So I bring that up because it's a myth. It was a very clever kind of campaign that was to put people, uh, uh, the idea forward to people that water is wasted that flows through this beautiful bay into the ocean, and that's the furthest thing through the truth. It's what keeps our system alive. It's what keeps the economy alive. Uh, all right, the, the second map is a reminder for people. People do forget that the water that is fresh that flows from the Sacramento San Joaquin River and through the other tributaries into the Delta moves through Suso and Marsh into San Pablo Bay and into the San Francisco Bay. Uh, it is what keeps our fisheries alive. The water that moves through this estuary, which is the largest estuary on the west coast of both North and South America, supports a $1.5 billion recreational salmon economy. It supports crab fisheries from here all the way up to uh, or through Oregon. Uh, it supports uh, wildlife. Uh, it supports um, when you put the sum total together, including um, our, um, the, um, I, I'm sorry, I lost for, for a second. When you put it together with our um, migra migrating waterfall, it is the largest uh, flyway stop on the West, uh, on the Pacific Flyway. When you, and one of the problems we have in California, it supports uh, a $750 million recreational economy in the Delta a $5.2 billion farming community in the Delta, but yet there has never been a cost benefit analysis done. And that is our major problem of what is the value of fresh water to this estuary and to the coastal communities that it supports from Monterey all the way up through Washington. In fact, um, Puget Sound orcas, the South Pod, they're programmed to eat the salmon that come through the Sacramento River through the Delta and through the San Francisco Bay. So you have multiple economies that are tied to a healthy bay and a healthy delta. So in the 1930s through the 50s, we created in California the Central Valley Project. The Central Valley Project is one of those two canals you see when you drive down from Tracy to Los Angeles. Uh, it supplies water through the Westlands Water District and other farm um, districts along the, uh, the I-5. Takes about maybe f uh, 40 to 50% of the water uh, that is moved out of the uh, Delta um, and into Southern California and the Southern part of the state. The second system that was brought on in the 1960s is the State Water Project. State Water Project actually um, is the supply not only for Los Angeles, but for the Kern County Water Agency at the south end of the San Joaquin Valley and uh, has given rise to the uh, empire of Stuart Resnick's farming. Uh, maybe some of you have read some of those stories uh, in Forbes and in Mother Jones over the years. But it's hundreds of thousands of acres of almonds and pomegranates um, and other crops that were placed on a land where there really is no groundwater supply. Of the water that is taken out of the Delta, uh, over the last 10 to 15 years, we are exporting, depending on the given period, 50% uh, of the Delta's freshwater supply through the existing pumps in Tracy at times. Um, we do know from science that you can only sustain the Delta and keep the estuary healthy if you don't take out more than 25% of the available freshwater supply. Going back to what the system looks like, of course, 
because you have a system that is freshwater that gradually becomes more salty, uh, those freshwater flows are essential uh, to keeping uh, the saltwater intrusion from moving into the delta, and that is what ultimately protects fisheries and water quality. One of the things I like to talk about at this point is what we saw uh, with climate change during the recent drought that went on for years. In 2014, uh, we were receiving reports of the uh, entrainment of herring at the big pumps in Tracy. Saltwater fish are not supposed to be that far inland. We see more and more uh, uh, sea lions moving further and further west and north into the delta on a regular basis. But what was really, I think, the most concerning and scary part for us was the development of toxic algal blooms during that time in the delta. Uh, and you've heard these stories, you've heard maybe in the news about what's happened in Florida and their water treatment system. Our, a, a good part of our problem was that the information about the toxic algal blooms, we had people calling our office, we were taking photos, we were sending them in to public health uh, departments, but the information wasn't coming back to us. It was two years after the fact that we learned that the toxicity of some of these algal blooms was so high that if a preschooler had been swimming near them, they very likely could have passed away from liver failure. Uh, it was just unhealthy. Uh, we're, there are reports this pe during this period of dogs who got into the system, they swam into an algal bloom, you would lose, you'd lose your pet. So why did that happen? It happened because during the drought, we never shut off the existing pumps in Tracy. Uh, there were a lot of complaints made that the pumping was too low, that we were protecting the fish. But analysis done by, I believe, the Bay Institute and RDC show that I think those pumps were only on something like 3 or 4% of the time to actually protect the delta smelt and other fisheries. The reason why the pumps were left on is because we had to share water with other parts of the state, and we had to keep a certain amount of flow moving out of the system so that we wouldn't have salt water, complete salt water intrusion into the pumping system so that we could protect the drinking water for supply for Metropolitan Water District. So what happened at the Delta during that time? The algal blooms grew. They were terrible smelling. Uh, there were parts of uh, st uh, Stockton near the waterfront you couldn't walk. Um, the cyanobacteria that comes off of them can be airborne and uh, have negative impacts on respiratory health for people. So it's not just a water quality issue. Crops that are irrigated with that kind of water, um, they don't survive. They're not safe. You can't, uh, there are studies that have been done. You can't irrigate with that water. Unanswered questions for us still are what happens when uh, water from toxic algal blooms percolates into groundwater systems. There have not been enough studies done. So you have to remember in, in the delta, in that northern part in the interior, our groundwater systems are all, all adjacent to the delta. So the condition of the delta, it doesn't just impact our drinking water supply for what we pump out of the delta, but it actually impacts our groundwater supplies as well, salt, chemicals. And then the last part, of course, um, was simply the uh, whole element of human contact. So when people talk about climate change presently, you hear a lot about what will happen going forward in terms of managing flood. That was a lot of the rationale for the twin tunnels. Um, the idea of a concept of a big gulp and a little sip. The real analysis showed it was a big gulp and a lot of extra water pulling on a big straw all the time um, it, within the modeling that they did for the project. But the big fear that we have in many ways is what happens when you hit the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth year of drought. And you um, are pulling too much water out of the system. What happens to water quality? And could we possibly lose the entire estuary? Um, this was the twin tunnel project as it was proposed. I brought a map of it today, though, so that you could see the full length of what was proposed. It was two 
twin tunnels, 35 miles long, uh, four stories each. They could remove uh, 9,000 cubic feet per second of the Sacramento River. Uh, sometimes the Sacramento River in the summer only flows at uh, 10 or 11 cubic feet per second. So we're thrilled. This project is gone. And it wasn't just that they said, we don't like the design, we're going to stop and do the redesign. We and about 34 other groups were part of the water board hearing to grant them the permit to build the project. That water board hearing has been suspended. It has been stopped. All the testimony has been archived. That process is no longer happening. The permits that were put in with the federal government to operate this project, because the project was a joint project of the Department of Water Resources of California and the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, that's the Federal Bureau of Reclamation, all those permits have been pulled as well. But taking it even a step, <laughs> taking it even a step further, the Newsom administration made the decision to rescind the environmental impact report and the plan itself. They stopped the litigation to validate the bond sales through the Department of Water Resources. And so this is where I become really hopeful because I did hear someone say, oh, but they're moving with a single tunnel. The Newsom administration could have just said, well, we don't like that project and we're going to go into redesign. But they didn't do that they stopped the entire process. And they stopped the entire process and at the same time have really done a pretty good job thus far of reaching out to people in the Delta community and to work with people across the state who have different views of how the Delta should be managed. Does that mean that two years from now we're going to be in love with a new project? We can't promise that. But what's really different this time, and we very much believe um, that we have an opportunity here, is that there is communication. Uh, when the Twin Tunnels Delta project was conceived, first under the Schwarzenegger administration, uh, then Governor Schwarzenegger pretty much announced I'm, to, to people in, in the Delta counties, well, we're going to build it and we don't care what you think. And then when we went through the whole process with the Brown administration, it actually went from bad to worse because there was absolutely no communication with anyone in the Delta counties. And we had to fight through uh, a high-end media campaign. Um, there were years where Restore the Delta was behind 3,000 media hits from the Rio Vista Herald to the New York Times trying to fight this project and long government processes. So. Where we see hope is it's easy to preach to the choir. It's harder sometimes to talk with people you disagree with. And right now, we are at least at a point where people are talking to each other and there is input being given. And the concerns of Delta communities from our elected officials, from water districts, from cities, municipalities, and environmental groups is being taken into account. So that's why we're hopeful. And as far as we see it at Restore the Delta, you have to try. We can see if we can come up with something better. Uh, we are advocating very much at Restore the Delta in terms of solutions for a process going forward in which, all right, State of California, you may come up with a plan that you think is best. Compare it to doing all the outside work in California on the water system without the tunnel. Do a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, evaluate what you get in terms of a public good. And then you can have a rational discussion. We've never had the rational discussion. So for us organizationally, it's almost a little bit harder. It's, sometimes it's easier to fight something than it is to go through the not so sexy grind of running a media campaign, but writing a lot of letters and reading a lot of detailed reports and sending in a lot of comments and nitpicking after detail after detail. But we're actually welcoming it as an opportunity to see if we could get to a point of coming up with a much better 
solution for managing the delta in the future. Um, and so there will be comparisons that we're hoping for that will be done between a, a tunnel project versus what happens if you rebuild those existing pumps in Tracy. What are the real impacts of sea level rise? Because you have to measure your sea level rise in the future with climate change against attenuation. Attenuation meaning how does the water, we'll go back and take a look uh, here at the photo, how does that water spread out between the sloughs uh, through the delta? Does it really make more sis, uh, sense to put an intake for uh, a water system on a tidal river or are you better off keeping it where you have it in a place that's inland and can be fortified with levees? So there's a lot to consider there. Our levees need to be strengthened in the delta to deal with climate change impacts from upstream flooding, uh, regardless of whether a tunnel is built or not. Does it become more cost effective to do that within the delta and protect your existing pumps so that you could share a sustainable yield of water supply? The other thing that we do see as hopeful for the Newsom administration when they made this announcement, and I want people to focus on this, they separated out what they called their portfolio projects for solving California's water problems from evaluating conveyance. So they're looking at the same things that we have advocated for for years, and I've brought uh, copies of our sustainable water plan. What happens if you build good water recycling plants in Southern California? What happens if you do stormwater capture and clean that water back up and use it for outdoor irrigation? Half of the water we send to urban Southern California is used for watering lawns and plants. Why can't we use stormwater capture in cisterns and recycled water to take care of those needs? What happens if you clean up and you restore your groundwater basins at the south end of the San Joaquin Valley to ensure that everyone in California has clean drinking water? What happens if you expand your wetlands up in the Sierra and create new ways to capture water supply with greater rains and a reduced snowpack? Um, the list kind of goes on and on, and we've thought very carefully about it for years. Other groups, the Pacific Institute, NRDC, they have more capacity, more scientists on staff. There are estimates that if you do all those things first for the dollar, you could bring in and create maybe six, seven more million acre feet of water in California. And so uh, those are the kind of solutions that we advocate for. And to a great degree, we do because we believe we have a right in the Delta, not only to save what we have, but to reclaim our natural history. I absolutely love this photo. This was taken at the turn of the last century. Um, this is near Sacramento. And that is the salmon run that they were pulling in. In the Delta, we used to can between uh, the turn of the last century and about 1940, five million pounds of salmon a year. And we do believe that the doubling goals that were set by the federal government years ago for healthy salmon runs should be restored. That is part of our historical heritage, our natural history in the state. And you know if the fisheries are thriving, that water quality tends to be pretty good for boaters and people as well. The problem, as far as we see it, in addition to what we could do for solutions, is that we have entirely too much unsustainable agriculture in Southern California particularly in the San Joaquin Valley. This is a really interesting map. Um, if you take a look at the very, very dark purple spaces, those are severely drainage impaired lands that are loaded with selenium, boron, and bromides around the Westlands Water District. And then at the south end of the map, where you see the dark purple, you have similar lands that are part of uh, Stuart Resnick's wonderful companies enterprises. The problem is we keep applying water, somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of the water that is exported from the delta into keeping these agricultural units alive. The water drains from that agriculture, it percolates through their groundwater systems, it ends up in the San Joaquin River and guess where it ends back up? In the delta. And so part of the problem with moving conveyance to the north end of the delta 
is that if you take away too much for the Sacramento Fresh River water supply, you have more and more of this kind of toxic water that rolls down the San Joaquin River and into the estuary. But whether conveyance is built or not, we still have five times more in water rights uh, promised in California through the Delta than actually exist in the system in an average year of water. That does not take into account climate change, where, yes, we'll have significant rain events, but we're going to have many more years of drought in between. So the question becomes, back to that cost-benefit analysis I was talking about at the beginning, this slice of agriculture in California contributes three-tenths of a percent to the state's GDP. It contributes fewer and fewer jobs because of the way agriculture has been mechanized in these communities. But it is using a significant portion of California's water supply. Um, I'm looking at the time here and realizing I do have to finish up, and I've talked about some of these things. So I, I want to kind of conclude on this note and then talk about solutions. 2017, California, in, in total, California produced 2.27 billion pounds of almonds with over 1 million acres of almonds planted. Almond uses um, about 10% of our developed water supply. A significant amount of that growth for those almonds uh, has happened in this area, particularly in Kern County. So we are of the mind that uh, as recommendations are coming in from other groups like PPIC, in which we've long advocated for, had reports done by uh, Eco Northwest, an economic environmental firm out of Oregon, there are a couple hundred thousands of acres that should probably be taken out of production in California agriculture or transformed into a much more sustainable type of agriculture so that we can reduce water use out of the delta and protect the estuary from the kind of pollutants that uh, come back down from the San Joaquin River into the estuary. So I think for this part of the talk, uh, I will conclude with that we believe there's a much better solutions. Um, sustainable water projects, levy improvements in the delta. We do know that we will always have to share water, but we want to share a science-based sustainable yield we want to fix existing infrastructure. We think that the Newsom's um, portfolio plan is a step in the right direction. We are thrilled that they're actually interacting and talking with people in the Delta. And now we can begin the long, hard slug of actually trying to work to solve California's water challenges and to protect the estuary. Thank you. Welcome and thanks for joining us at the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon live from St. Francis Yacht Club. Our speaker today is Barbara Berrigan Perella. She is the uh, co-founder and executive director of Restore the Delta. And so Barbara, uh, we, hear, we hear all these acronyms constantly in the Delta debate. Can you tell us who are the players? Give us a quick summary of who are the people who want the tunnels or wanted the tunnels and want, and who are those who were against the tunnels? Just give us a short summary. Um, the California water fix process was really driven by Metropolitan Water District, MWD of Southern California. Uh, they are the major wholesaler to about 28 member agencies through Southern California uh, for their water supplies. They draw water from the Delta and from the Colorado River system. And really their whole... Uh, organization, their whole district is uh, a wholesale. It's exactly what it is. It's water wholesale. It's about taking water and appropriating it from other places and selling it to water districts and water retail agencies in Southern California. Uh, Kern County Water Agency uh, is one of the other major players in it. Um, Stuart Resnick, who does own Palm Wonderful, I believe has 52% control of the Kern County Water Bank which was actually uh, 
uh, privatized. It was gifted from the state to Kern County uh, uh, Water Bank. And then the agency itself is heavily influenced by um, Stuart Resnick and his um, involvement in agriculture at that end of the valley, uh, his development of agriculture. And then for a good long time, we had the Westlands Water District that was higher up on the map, the dark purple section in the middle uh, of California, and some of those other smaller, uh, what we call West San Joaquin, West Side San Joaquin Valley Water Districts. Uh, they were the people who were brought online uh, to create uh, agriculture in the valley uh, in the 1930s and 50s. When they were originally brought online, um, they were given 150 acres per couple, and their farms were never supposed to get any bigger than that, according to the federal government. And they consolidated their holdings through marriages and created large industrial farms and really have a, also an outsized influence besides Metropolitan Water District on water policy in California. So those are the people who are really pushing for the project. Um, opposed, and I'm not saying this if, you know, completely facetiously, but I want to say just about everybody else. Um, during the 12 years that we were in operation, we did, uh, we spoke with over 300,000 people we did a documentary which still exists on YouTube with Ed Begley Jr. Um, there wasn't a place that we didn't go when we told our story that people weren't with us. And surprisingly, a good number of people in Southern California are with us. They didn't want the tunnels because they saw the cost as too high for the amount of water that could be delivered. And people down there are much more interested in read what we call regional self-sufficiency and water independence um, than you would think, because they know it's a better bang for the do for the buck. So now you mentioned earlier that um, we're safe; there won't be tunnels. Uh, tell us, is there going to be one tunnel? I heard some different <laughs> discussions about this, and we want to make sure everybody understands there were going to be two forty-foot diameter tunnels. And what's the current state of play? Well, we and nobody really completely knows. We were told that they are going to examine conveyance. They being the, 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 Newsom, administration. the, the Newsom administration in the state. Uh, and the Department of Water Resources would begin putting together a new plan and a new effort. But you have to remember, all the permits, all the, the EIR, everything was rescinded. So that means that they are really in the process of starting from scratch. Now, there were what we call joint power authorities, which were groupings of water districts that were put together and formed in 2018. And those JPAs are still in existence. But right now, they do not have a certified EIR to begin construction. So from what we understand and know, there will be processes created again. They're gonna have to create a plan again. They're gonna have to create an environmental impact report again to evaluate what will be happening in terms of new conveyance? Um, and what does that look like? Is it for sure a single tunnel? Is it a tunnel that is the size of a metaphoric garden hose? Is it a tunnel that's the size of two tunnels? We don't know yet. And I'm not sure other people completely uh, know how that will come about yet either. So now I know you're not a demographer, but I've got to ask a couple of questions about a number of people and impact. How many people live in the Delta area? Five Delta counties, there's four million people. And of the four million people, about 33, 34% qualify as what we call part of the environmental justice population. You have to remember, when they sold the story about uh, it's farmer versus fish, we in California were told that we were taking water from poor communities and farm worker communities. There is a difference between water going to irrigators in the San Joaquin Valley and the communities that don't have clean drinking water. We work with the communities that don't have clean drinking water in the San Joaquin Valley. But what was left out of the equation during all that analysis is that we have a large environmental justice population within the interior of the Delta. There are parts of Stockton uh, which actually percentage-wise has the largest environmental justice population in California. This means people of color or people low income who uh, suffer through a disparate amount of environmental um, negative impacts in public health. 
whether it's water quality, uh, whether it's nutrition and food deserts, whether it's air pollution and toxicity in soil. So uh, there was no analysis done on that population. And so we really, uh, we did some serious reports. A lot of our testimony in front of the water board was what are the impacts on those populations. We have a significant number of people between the Bay Area, particularly the East Bay, up through the Delta who fish for sustenance. And nobody looked at what the impacts were going to be on uh, mercury consumption and other toxins within fish for that population as well. So, uh, And then how many people recreate in the Delta? I've heard different numbers. I know the Delta Recreation Community is worth about $750 uh, million per year. Um, the boating numbers seem to fluctuate. I do, there are, I do know there are places that are passed through on the weekend with 160,000 vehicles per day uh, on all those marinas th uh, throughout the entire Delta community. Now we call it the Bay Area, this 8 million person group around uh, San Francisco's Bay. That's the Bay Area, it's the San Francisco Bay Area. And if you go down the peninsula, you know, from San Francisco down Millbrae, Palo Alto, and you go up the East Bay, up Emeryville, all the way up to Emeryville and around, you see that the whole bay shares this one body of water. And effectively, when you say save the Delta, isn't that another way of saying save the Delta, which feeds the bay? In other words, save the bay. Isn't it just as important that we recognize the impact will not just be on the Delta, but be on the entire region? We, uh, we, we've had various versions of signs and campaigns that have run throughout the years. But, you know, it, uh, right up to the end of this, it's always been save the San Francisco Bay Delta because it is one estuary. Um, and what happens in the Delta has impact here. Uh, on the Bay Area, which is where I lived first before uh, uh, we, I moved into the interior of the Delta. So the two are linked. Uh, th there is always, I think, been an effort to keep people kind of divided on this issue. Um, even within the five Delta counties, because you don't have roads that run through the interior of the Delta. You have five different counties, five different county governments. You can't drive from one end to the other. You can't, you know, now you could drive through freeways, of course, everywhere. But people were really divided up geographically uh, and politically um, as a result of the geography. And so one of the reasons why I always use that map with the Bay and the Delta linked together to tell the story is it's amazing to me how many people don't realize the connection between the interior Delta and the San Francisco Bay. Thank you. We have a question from Freddie Krause. Freddie. Yeah, I'd like to say uh, my father was an electrical engineer and he set, helped set up the power grid to run the pumps. And he told me at the time that uh, those pumps use more electricity than the state of California burns in one day. Um, every year right now, the two pumping plants use about 15 to 20% of our state's electrical supply uh, to move water. And then you have uh, another significant amount of electricity used at the Tehachapi's to get water over to Metropolitan Water District. So I think it runs about 23, 24% total of our annual electricity. Also, and I was involved in this, uh, the Clifton Four Bay, mm -hmm. where the, all the water ends up before it's pumped south, has to be dredged uh, every couple of years because of the silt. And now I was wondering, you know, the state of California, we're on so much, uh, natural gas, why can't we have desalinization plants in Southern California? Desal is, people up north love it, people down south we work with hate it, okay? So let me tell you how we kind of approach the issue. Desal is expensive, and the technology, it's getting better and better in terms of solar uh, desalination, and I do not believe we will move forward as a state without desalination. But here's a question. We haven't done all the low-hanging fruit yet. We haven't built the water recycling plants. We haven't created the stormwater capture systems. Um, we haven't retired some of the really polluted ag lands that we maybe shouldn't be farming. Um, we haven't cleaned up our groundwater systems. 
and, and, and those tend to be less expensive. And I, for one, I know what I want to leave for debt for my kids and my grandkids. I really favor doing the most cost-effective solution to solve our water challenges first. Then you have groups that could keep working on the technology and then move forward towards desalination. Thank you. <clears throat> Jim Lucier has a question. Jim. Yes, I want to <clears throat> build on Ron's question about the relationship between the Delta and the Bay. And of course, San Francisco and a lot of the peninsula communities get their water from the Hetch Hetchy water system. Right. And, uh, and so I'm curious about the relationship between that water system and the Delta, and then also some of the um, attempts to try to limit the flow of the Tuolumne River, which would in turn <laughs> reduce the flow of water available to the residents of San Francisco and other places. So I'm just curious about that so, whole interplay. But, but there's a whole problem with reducing flow on the Tuolumne. It's the flow that goes into the San Joaquin that goes into the Delta. Right. San Francisco saying, Public right. Utility, uh, com, you know, San Francisco Public Utilities is on the opposite side of the flows fight that's going on for the Delta right now. Remember I said we started as a campaign that worked on water quality and quantity prior to the tunnels project. We have not had enough flow moving through the Delta and out through the Delta, not pumped away uh, for well over 30 years. And that is why we are on the verge of losing Delta smelt and we see all our other fisheries in serious decline. It's also bad for water quality and during the drought, it caused those toxic algal bloom problems. The problem that we have is, you know, we, we delayed as a state the, the process that went forward in front of the State Water Resources Control Board uh, for over 20 years. We ended up with an outcome that kind of split the difference on what we need for flow moving through the delta. On the San Joaquin River side, science tells us we need 60% flows moving through and out of that river to keep the system healthy. Uh, the people who farm upstream in that river system along the Tuolumne, Merced, Stanislaus, and San Joaquin rivers wanted those flows to stay at roughly the 20% level they are. The water board split the baby and came up with a 40% amount. Here's the problem. At the end of the Brown administration, when that decision came down, there was a push by the Department of Resor uh, Water Resources to create a voluntary settlement process. And that voluntary settlement process is when you get everyone together in the room and you carve up the water. So those meetings are moving forward right now. Um, but there's a couple interesting things. Guess who's not in the room in that process? Delta people. It, it doesn't have to be me. Uh, we don't have people from our water districts, our municipalities, our county supervisors. They're not involved in that process. So the decision is being made outside of the Delta, how much water gets to move through the Delta. We think that's kind of problematic. Um, however, that process, when it's finished, will go back to the State Water Resources Control Board. And when the board voted on their decision, uh, they had told those involved that they had to bring something back to the water board that would be better for the Delta than uh, the plan that they had voted on. And it doesn't look like it's quite shaping up that way. So we'll have to see, I think, what happens. Um, Water conservation is going to have to take place all over California. It's not just going to be in Southern California. We're all going to have to get smarter about managing water if we're going to save our waterways and our natural environment. And Julia Whittakin, tell us about Facebook viewers. What do they have to ask? <laughs> we actually we have listeners now from Mexico and South Africa and Australia. Good. What's going on? Great. Yeah. Terrific. But also... Uh, d another comment, and there are great compliments on you and your presentation and the information. It's been very Bravo. good. Bravo. So, okay. Thank right. you. <laughs> yeah. a, a, a couple questions. Uh, shouldn't, from Al Alex Kent, who is from the Bay Area, shouldn't there, uh, there be quantity standards for both water retention in the reservoirs before the water is released for Bay flushing and salinity for fish, and also standards for cleanliness in the Bay? Seems like the cleanliness side of the equation should focus more on pollution control and many cities release treated sewage into the bay. Perhaps the cities need to consider a better approach. So let's talk about water discharge in America. 
when you discharge sewage? Sure, let's talk about it. Where, where, where does it go? It goes into your waterways. Um, the key is you have to have the best standard of treatment uh, before you discharge that water. Uh, cities like Stockton were forced into compliance. Sacramento, forced into compliance. I understand there's a problem here presently with a, a water discharger in the Bay Area. We believe, of course, that everyone has to be held to the highest standard. But what's happening is the agriculture industry is pushing that as a campaign again of blame the victim. Fresno discharges into rivers. We have all this ag runoff in California that makes its way down the rivers and into the delta. This isn't a, let's point the finger, you have to get better. No, you have to get better. Everyone has to get better, and it ha we have to hold ourselves to the highest standards to protect our water supply and protect public health. Julia, um, other comments? Yes, from this one from Fe Pedro Fred Foling Sailor in Australia. Okay. Let Barbara know we have a similar issue in Australia with the Murray Darling Basin Plan. Yes. Recent mass fish kills because of the ongoing drought and water allocation to cover farming. And it gives a, a website that that uh, tells all about yes. it. So. Thank you. So, Barbara, um, as a technoid, I think to myself, t as a technologically conscious human, technoid, um, it, I look at this problem and I have a couple of questions. It seems to me that uh, agro runoff is not going to decrease. Uh, and the amount of water that is available to absorb it um, if we decrease that amount of water, the problem is going to get worse. And that's right. we've seen that happen every time there's a drought, the uh, algae blooms flare up because we have less freshwater flushing. That's right. So that's like a microcosm of the problem. It seems to me this is not a problem that we here have. It's a problem. Water scarcity is common in Asia, Middle East, yes. Africa. We just got through hearing about it in Australia. It seems like a tunnel is a 16th century solution to a 21st yes. century problem. Well, we're in California. It seems to me like we should use that $20 billion or whatever it might be available for plan B to um, improve the technology for solar power desalinization or some other technology which, which we could then export to the rest of the world, help them solve their problem and uh, help us you know, create businesses. Well, we completely agree with you. So. On a small scale, compared to the tech economy here in San Francisco, we have actually been partners uh, with the County Office of Education in San Joaquin County. Uh, the State Water Board is joining us this year. Um, our uh, techno um, technology uh, centers that are run through the county through state programs. This is going to be our fifth year of an H2O hackathon that we have been partners in. Wonderful. And we're really excited because we have finally been able to move um, the Water Board to come in as a partner with San Francisco Estuary Institute uh, from here in the Bay to work with data to create an app that tracks algal bloom systems uh, so that you can actually monitor them, uh, track them, see how they're developing, see if they're becoming toxic, and actually report in a timely manner back to the community because there is no way to put signage up on 1,100 miles worth of waterways. Uh, that's one solution, and that is just scratching the surface. Again, you know, going back to the idea of stormwater capture, getting water back underground, getting it cleaned, and being able to reuse it um, kind of fits right hand in hand with some of the technology that you're talking about, and we do believe that tech is the solution in the long run. Commodore Heineken has a question. Uh, back when the Westlands was developed, I know there was discussion about a drain for exactly the purpose you're, you're right. uh, stating. Is there any word on that or is it just too expensive? It's expensive and the process from what we understand is somewhat falling apart. Um, who, who wants to take responsibility? Uh, there are better things that can be done. We have heard anecdotally, I wanna say this anecdotally, that um, there are growers who are looking at in developing an industrial hemp industry because it uses about 40% less water than almonds. And uh, it can, you can grow industrial hemp in brackish water and you can create a whole plastics industry out of it uh, that's much more sustainable than oil plastics. 
they're good business people. And maybe our, advers our ad uh, adversaries in uh, the water wars, but they are good business people. And if the water isn't there, they're going to have to get smart about what they're going to farm and how to make a living with it. And so I kind of see some hope there. So I have a question uh, on a sort of charged issue. I've heard about water rights being purchased by Southern California water interest. That is to say, Northern California water rights being purchased by Southern California interest. Is there something to that? Well, we had Metropolitan Water District buy five islands in the Delta. Um, that makes them one of the biggest landowners in the Delta, and we find that problematic. You have Metropolitan Water District and Westlands buying up water rights upstream in California, um, uh, including uh, bottling water facilities, bottled water campaigns, um, companies. Um, so uh, it is problematic. We see it as really problematic in the Delta because why should regional water districts be able to buy up and control uh, another community's watershed? Uh, there, we have to work together. We have to share water, but it's really problematic. It's problematic for us in the Delta. A sailor in the Bay for years has a question. Grace Knight. <laughs> well, my... Uh comment and question is desaltation. I read The Economist magazine. Their article was not about our water. It was about world water and right. desaltonization. There is a waste product of that. Yes. And what's happening? They're putting the, the salt back in the water, which makes it even worse. So that's a caution. I, I agree with you. I, I don't think people get gung-ho. I think the technology will get better and better. I think there's hope. But again, we have a long way to go with easy solutions uh, until we have that technology perfected. So I think you said earlier you saw a, a series of alternatives that are on hand right now that don't require as much development. And your plan would be that we activate these uh, reclamation activities and other available uh, alternatives before, but then we potentially could do a larger technological fix. But that's the way to use the, the Yeah, I, you start, start with what's easy. Uh, it, this is actually going back to the Australia case during their great drought. They did everything that was easy. Uh, and they stopped some major projects that they didn't need uh, because they had to move quickly. And that's what we see as hopeful about the Newsom administration's portfolio plan. Um, we can work on a lot of the projects that I listed in the presentation and increase water supply rapidly. And then you can work on perfecting the technology so you don't have those kind of waste products going forward. Great. John Cumberpatch has a question. He is the senior member in the club in the building right now, having joined in 1952. John, wow. always great to have you here, sir. Thank you. Uh, who controls the on-off switch on the pumps in, in Tracy? And, and who would control the, the throttle on the, on the tunnels that were built? Okay, so the on and off switch on the pumps right now are controlled by the Department of Water Resources and the Bureau of Reclamation for their two pumping systems. Of, of California <laughs> or federal? One federal, one state. So Department of Water Resources of California, Federal Bureau of Reclamation. With the tunnels plan as it was written, the water operations would be controlled by the Joint Powers Authority, the water exporters, in consultation with fishery agencies in a closed door process that would be very hard to access from the public. That was, and still is, one of my major complaints. Um, it doesn't allow itself for transparency. We have been told any plan put forward going forward is gonna solve a lot of these transparency issues and that's something we will work to push. Is, um, last question, Barbara. <clears throat> Summarize three simple bullet points that everybody who's concerned about this issue can do. What can people do? You can call your legislature, legislators right now to support SB1. SB1 is a bill that is moving through Sacramento uh, to protect environmental regulations that are being removed by the Trump administration. The reason why it is important is because that will help us protect water quality standards for the Delta and for the Bay and for California's rivers. That's important. Um, second, uh, I think, cause of action uh, that everyone here can take um, is really 
sign up for our newsletter. We're pretty prolific and we track a lot of issues, but also support your Bay Area organizations like the Bay Institute, San Francisco Estuary Institute. People are doing really good work tracking what's happening in Water California here locally as we are. And I think you should follow and read very broadly. Um, third, uh, as you see how the uh, Delta and the Bay should be managed, stay in constant contact with your elected officials. Make sure they stay on the right side of things and let the Newsom administration know how important it is to you and for what you love to protect the San Francisco Bay and the Delta. Great. You've been watching and at the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon live from St. Francis Yacht Club. Our speaker today has been Barbara Berrigan Perella, co-founder and executive director of Restore the Delta, who's just had a huge win in stopping the tunnels. And uh, we want to say thank you very much for the great work that you're doing, Barbara. Thanks. We appreciate it. And with that, the luncheon thank is you. adjourned. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Thank you. 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 Thank you.